He was a yeshiva student. He came from an orthodox home. Mm -hmm. My father-in-law was um, observant, and uh, oh, his parents were observant. I came from a Russia Shani Yom Kippur home. Okay, uh, you know when you go to shul and then you go to Bronx Park for the afternoon. <laughs> but um, so I, but my home was kosher. My mother kept a kosher home, but my background was very limited. My parents are em immigrants. From uh, immigrated emigrated from Poland in the early 30s, uh, my father was always a staunch Zionist, and uh, he was not very religious, but he had a, a religious upbringing. He did send me to yeshiva, and uh, um, my Jewish upbringing was such that he was very intent on Jewish culture. Uh, I didn't speak English until I was five or six years old. I, I was born in Manhattan. And uh, at Beth Israel Hospital, <laughs> there's a sign that says Norton was here. Well, Our backgrounds are, are varied. We uh, did not come from, uh, I don't like the word religious, observe, particularly observant homes, although my, my father was, lived in shul, uh, in an orthodox shul, which was not what it is today. He was a passionate Zionist. Um, I lived next door to my grandparents for years who were not particularly observant in terms of Shabbos, mm -hmm. but I was surrounded by being Jewish. My whole life was connected with being Jewish. Well, so my parents came from, from Russia. Um, my father escaped from the Polish army by hiding under a chair, uh, under a table. Under a table. And he wasn't that sure if to yeah, go I'll the never, chair, I'll never, under the table. table. I'll never understand how he ever got out of uh, uh, out of Poland, but apparently he hid under hay wagons, etc., etc. And he, to to the very day of his death, he was a, horribly afraid of policemen. He was sure or that anybody in the oh, uniform, he, even a mailman, he was sure they were coming to get him. And however, he uh, he was really a self-made man. Uh, he first arrived in Canada, and then came to the United States because his parents lived here. And when they came, he was teaching Hebrew. And he met a group of other chevra who were teaching Hebrew. And there were about five five boys or whatever, uh, grina as they called them. And they got together and decided what they could do to make a living. Because you certainly didn't make a living too much as just a Hebrew teacher. We both came from immigrant families. We were first generation. And uh, my in-laws were also not, I mean, they also had a kosher house, but weren't that observant. But Jewish, they sent their son to a yeshiva as a kid. And so he really was very knowledgeable and wanted to continue. I grew up also in a household. My mother had been a Hebrew teacher. My father was a, a very, he, they neither had any American education at all, but my father was a very learned man who had, was a yeshiva bacha in, in Europe. I had a background for that. I'm a, a survivor from the uh, 1940 invasion of Belgium by the Germans. And we spent some time getting here, like 18 months, and um, in Belgium, where I come from, my father was one of the founders of the Tachkamoni School, which was a boy a day school for boys. 
just as the war was about to start, they started a day school for girls. So I had an interest in it right from the beginning. I was very much interested. I was a Zionist, and uh, it was natural for me to endorse what Rabbi Boxer was trying to develop. My daughter, my oldest daughter, was getting ready to start school. I really wanted her to get a yeshiva background. I had gone to school, uh, Shalamath School, which was the first girls, yeshiva for girls, and loved it so. I wanted to give that same experience to my kids. But I, we, we were conservative Jews, and I just wasn't feeling comfortable about sending them to, I forget the name of the local, yeshiva. Mm -hmm. And at some point, my father-in-law, who was active in Jewish affairs, told us that uh, he had gone to a federation meeting and they were talking about starting a, a yeshiva, mm -hmm. you know, for the, for the movement. And he got me information, and I acted on it. And it was they were going to be starting a, uh, a day school. We looked into that, and it sounded appealing. It had all they presented all the methodology that we were looking for, mm -hmm. and we signed up. We took a chance. Our oldest daughter had begun uh, Dove Revel Yeshiva. I think she was in first grade. Anyhow, Myron gets a call from. <laughs> uh, one of the people that I regarded very highly in Queens, who was my mentor, one of them, was Rabbi Ben Sion Boxer of the Forest Hill Jewish Center, which at that time was probably the largest uh, synagogue on Long Island. And uh, he said to me, Myron, um, I'd like you to come over and talk to me. I want to ask you to put your daughter into the Solomon Schechter School, which we are opening. And I said, but she's in the first grade already elsewhere. He said, yeah, I know, I know, but it's absolutely crucial uh, that she come into the Solomon Chuck School. Otherwise, we may not have a school. I said, oh, come. It doesn't depend on her. Mm -hmm. He said, well, in the second grade, we want to start two grades. The second grade, we have, I think, six youngsters. And she would be the seventh. And that's like the dividing line between viable and non-viable. <laughs> for us, and so it's absolutely prerequisite. I said, my son, you want to do me a favor? I want to put my wife on. You tell her that we got to pull the kid out of the school. Where she was and, very happy. Yeah. Very good it was a bit of a problem, but thankfully we did it and it worked. The teachers were, some of them were rabbis, some were not, but there were, some were just tired old men who were refugees from Europe. They thought the, you know, they firmly believed the rod, uh, spare the rod, spoil the child. And they beat the living daylights out of me. And fortunately, I left that school uh, and I went to another school where I had probably the best teacher I've ever had in any educational system I've ever been in. He, would, he loved the students and he used to read us Hebrew poetry and, and read us, we'd study the prophets with him. He'd invite us for a Shabbat over at his to his house. Mm -hmm. where he and his wife would give us candy and, uh, and cakes and talk about poetry and literature and it, it kind of um, infused me and then um, I, my father introduced me to Zionist youth movements and I became a member and I went to camp mm -hmm. and I was smitten by it. I, at that point in my life I was uh, just going into high school and that's all I could think about was Israel, living in Israel, and, and Judaism, and, and girls. My parents lit candles and they observed Shabbos to a certain degree. Um, we went to shul periodically on Shabbos, and uh, we were always in shul, of course, for uh, Yom Kippur and Rosh Hashanah. But uh, that's pretty much what my religious background was at that time. When I came right. home after four years in the Air Force, I met you-know-who. and. Uh, <laughs> We got together and thought about it, and we decided that we wanted to have a Jewish home. And of course, you know, it's like asking a question, you give an answer, but then you say, what constitutes a Jewish home? And we investigated, and we read, and uh, we decided to act in a certain way. So, um, 
they thought about law, but that was too long a study. Uh, so they thought about pharmacy, and they decided that they would become, all become pharmacists. This is five of them. So they went to Fordham and met with the priest. And the priest sees these all with heavy accents, etc., etc. But they were all very educated from, from Europe, and they could read English, but they couldn't really speak it that well. So he's looking at them, and he says, all right, if you pass the English regions, I will take you into the school and take care of you. So they, um, they all went to this private academy. Where they got the money for, I don't know. From Hebrew school. And they studied very hard for a year. And every one of them passed the English regions. And then they came back to this priest. And he said, I'll keep my word. And he took them into the school, into Fordham Pharmacy. And two years later, they graduated. So they were able to start a business. Before we even knew we were going to have daughters, we didn't want that kind. I had not grown up in a house where the girls were put aside. My mother worked, my father worked, my mother-in-law worked, my father-in-law worked. So both of us had this sense that girls need an education just as much as boys do, and not just an American. You're a better Jew if you have an education. I had a Hebrew education. I trained in the beginning in Antwerp, and then I went on here, I went to Herzliya, and I went to uh, a Hebrew teacher's uh, training school. So I was really involved in, in the education, and it, it's helpful. You can support your children. I was part of an Orthodox family, and when I came here, I went to the, the, the shul was con uh, Orthodox, I felt more comfortable, it gave me a little more freedom. One teacher, Bella Krugman. Then there was Mrs. Krugman, who was also an unbelievable teacher. I spoke to Jeremy in Jerusalem. He lives in Jerusalem, I was our third child. And they said, you know, what teachers do you remember? And of course, immediately, when I said that, he said, together with me, Hadassah Rubel. Uh, there was a music teacher named, I think her first name was Hadassah, Mrs. Rubel. And then we came across two teachers, Weiss. One was Booney Weiss, then there was another Mrs. Weiss, a very young teacher who came from Israel. By the way, I didn't mention a Kanta Schnitzer, who was largely responsible for, you know, just about everything they know. And Seal Gossett was his social, was his teacher at the time. Then there was Mrs. Gossett, who taught sixth grade. There were some really wonderful teachers who really mentored them. Um, Marcy Konigsberg. We found that Mrs. West was most, most unusual. Penina Dustan. And she was a first grade Hebrew teacher. There is another teacher that yes, should be mentioned. Go ahead. Uh, Yaakov Gladstone. Uh, Mrs. Gossett was in sixth grade, I think, math. As far as the um, English subject for the secular studies were concerned, because when they left and went to high school, they were so far advanced uh, ahead of the class, mm -hmm. and I'm sure you must have heard that from others, and they said high school's a snap. There were two men, Mr. Guarneri and Mr. Yeager math teachers. The teachers were great, mm -hmm. were just great, mm -hmm. and so interested in each child as an individual. Remember, one day um, he's working feverishly into the night, I mean, feverishly, and I'm going, I said, Richard, what is this? This project looks enormous. He said, yeah, it takes, it's, it's big, it's really big. I have to hand it in in the morning. And sure enough, in the morning, morning came and he handed in his project. And Seal Gossett was his social, was his teacher at the time. 
And uh, he did not do well on that. I will not say what his mark was, because uh, I don't know that Richard would want me to, but he did not do well. And she called me, I went in to see her, and she said, Sue, I just, I just want him to know that I knew that this was done overnight. I said, well, Seal, how long did it, when did you give him the assignment? Three months ago. <laughs> Moshe, we call him Moshe, the oldest, Daniel and Rachel. Well, they also went to Prosdor, which is the seminary version of, of Hebrew high school, which was an excellent program. Uh, it was took place in different synagogues here and on Sunday at the seminary. It was a really good program and um, they went there also. Mark and Rachel went to Queens College um, Daniel went to the joint program of JTS and Columbia, and after that he went to rabbinical school at JTS. Rachel went to the Wurzweiler School of Social Work and got her master's in social work from there. Okay, they went to Jamaica High School, both of them at that point, because we had tried to create a high school, but couldn't quite make it. Rena so, went to Princeton and Lisa went to Yale which was very nice. <laughs> Rena then went on to law school. Elisa went and got her master's in soil microbiology and was a science teacher and is now um, general counsel for the Hyatt Hotel Corporation. And Elisa is working for the state of Maryland Education Department using race to the top money to help design curricula for teachers. Marion you know. is the oldest. She went to kindergarten in Manhattan before we moved to Forest Hills. Mm -hmm. Then she went to first grade in Forest Hills at PS 101. Mm -hmm. And then second grade. They started first and second grade together. She was in the second grade. Started in second Naomi first grade. started the next year. She was in first grade when Marion was in third grade. And then three years later, Marianne they went to the high school of music and art. And then she went to the University of Chicago, where she, her first biology teacher converted her to medicine. <laughs> um, Naomi, um, Naomi went to Forest Hills High School and then went to Stony Brook. And Debbie went to Forest Hills High School and then went to Queens College. Her career, she's a physician. She works for the uh, NIH, the National Institute of Health, and travels all over the world to help people get medical coverage. Naomi uh, is the managing editor of Lilith Magazine. Um, she also is very sociable and... Uh, we have three children. Uh, Donnie, Gil, and Tevi. Now that Donnie has grown up, he's called Dan. He still teaches at McGill. And one of the main things he does is uh, give lectures and he writes a lot of books. He's a, what they call a presidential scholar. Dan is, Dan is uh, uh, really pretty influential in his own right. He is um, the chief counsel of, um, of GlaxoSmithKline, which is the second largest um, uh, pharmaceutical in the world. And he does a tremendous amount of traveling now. Then we have Tevi, our youngest, who as a child in Salomon Shefter was extremely quiet. And now as a grown-up, nobody would ever believe that when we say he gives a lot of talks. He's a consultant on health. He was the uh, assistant deputy of uh, Health and Human okay. Services he was under the Bush. Deputy, not assistant. Oh, he was deputy, the deputy secretary. Me. 
deputy secretary. Well, they went to they, they all went to Jamaica High School, mm-hmm. and uh, which were, at that point was a pretty decent school. Uh, they didn't want to travel, and for they and then they went on to different schools. The youngest who went to uh, Boston University, David went to um, oh my goodness, goodness uh, in the arts uh, the school uh, school in Boston. I can't remember the name just off the top of my head, but he got his degree at NYU in fine arts, and so went to school up in Massachusetts. All my kids went to college in Massachusetts. For some reason, uh, they thought it was more glamorous or whatever. Richard, our oldest, was in, um, he had gone to North 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 Shore Hebrew Academy Academy for one year in Great Neck. They accepted accepted him into kindergarten when he was uh, four, I guess, yeah. Because when he was five and we moved into Queens, we Milt wanted him in Solomon Schechter, and that's when we met Rabbi Kaplan, who was instrumental in in getting uh, in allowing us to enroll Richard. Richard's experience in Solomon Schechter was so positive. Uh, Stephanie followed three years later, our daughter, and again another positive experience. Lisa also Richard. played a very important uh, uh, part of a memory that we both have, and we found this uh, thing. This is. Um, a pamphlet speaking of Haletzan or Habatran for Purim. Uh, she was in a play, one of the first plays that they put on there, and I remember she was wearing a red, red tie. She was tights. a Batran, a clown. The clown, and she a, was then on the Habatran bum bum she still sings bum it. bum. And the Habatran chan 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 chan, and she still sings it to this day. But this was written by Rabbi Alex Kaplan and his wife. Very crucial people to the summer. Just shut the school. Two yeah. older kids. We moved out here. As I told you, we were in Israel. So Lisa was in eighth grade. I think we moved right after her graduation. We moved here, and she, she went to uh, Herrick's High School. John is a poor kid. We slept in through three or four different schools to the Yeshiva Flapish for ninth grade. To the high school. To the high school, ninth grade. Just the high school. Graduated from eighth grade here. Our, Myron's parents lived there, so during the week he stayed, we figured, what a better deal than that, to live with your grandparents during the week. And every Friday we used to pick him up and bring him home for Shabbos. Sunday night. We brought him but he didn't home. like it. He didn't like <laughs> it. So then after that we transferred him to Newtown. Yeah. Newtown High School. Right. In Queens, mm-hmm. where Lisa was going. And then we moved out here, I guess. Yeah. So then he went to Herrick's High School. Uh, Jonathan... Did he go right after that to Israel? Yeah, he went to uh, the Mahane uh, Lamatre Chutzla yeah, program yeah. for a year in Israel. The uh, Madriche Le yeah. yeah. So he went there, and Elisa went on to the new school at uh, Hofstra. And school. then Jonathan went to Prozdor also, oh, uh, the seminary all later on. They all went to Prozdor. <coughs> and the Schlepping. others went to Prozdor too. Uh, they were involved in, in these various things, and, um, you know, the. Original identity was with the, with the Solomon Schechter School, and uh, these kids kept meeting each other in different settings, and that, of course, was part of the fun. Um, at the high school, at the Prozdor, he would meet a lot of the kids who went to... Sa- uh, Sandy was in Bayside mm-hmm. High School, and but when Janet was ready for school, they had built this Cardoza right on the corner. Mm-hmm. So that's where the other two went for high school. Mm-hmm. And then on to college. Uh, and not to uh, high school, to junior high and all that, and then on to college. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, my daughter Sandy is the oldest, I hate to think of this. She was in, um, she worked with special needs children. Mm-hmm. And she ran, um, this is an early childhood special needs, and it encompassed several towns in the, in the Boston area, and she started working there as a teacher mm-hmm. and eventually became in charge, director, I nice. guess is the title. Mm-hmm. And Janet is uh, in Washington. She's a lawyer. She works with the government to get <laughs> all these bad guys, these big mm-hmm. corporations. Steve, um, is working in, in the district attorney's office. He's a, a DA, and uh, he's, been, he's been doing that for quite a while.
this is a funny story, Rabbi Kaplan, uh, Gil really didn't like kindergarten. I think he was bored. So he was really a very bright kid. They all were. And you had to um, simulate them somehow. So I went to Rabbi Kaplan, and my goal was to, instead of sending him full day to kindergarten, send him half day to kindergarten. That was my goal. Um, and uh, Rabbi Kaplan looked at me and said, no, we're going to move him to first grade. And this was around November, December. I said, but he can't read yet. And he said, listen, just because you're a guidance counselor doesn't mean you know everything. He says, let me try it. I'll put him into um, first grade in December, and let's see what happens. I said, all right, I'll make a deal with you. If he learns to read by the end of December and he can keep up with the class, he stays. If not, he goes back. So he learned to read. Richard was, uh, came home on a Friday and uh, was not in a good mood for the weekend, very down. Late Sunday night, he, he approached me and said, Mom, you have to come to school tomorrow morning. Rabbi Kaplan wants to see you. I said, what? what are you? All of a sudden, on a Sunday night, and I'm saying to myself, oh, my God, so this is why he had a bad week, and I can't imagine what he did. Sure enough, Monday morning came, and I went to school with him, and we walked into Rabbi Alex Kaplan's office, and Rabbi Kaplan asked Richard to step out and do something. I can't recall what that was. And he looked at me and said, Sue, I'm so happy he did what he did. Now, what did he do? He, on Friday afternoon, wanted to call me so that he could go to a friend's house and he knew he couldn't go without asking permission. But his teacher wouldn't let him out the room, let him leave the room. So he got up and he walked out himself without permission to the office, used the phone and called me. I had no idea, no knowledge that that was being done without permission. But Rabbi Kaplan explained it to me. And he said, but you know what? This was Rabbi Kaplan. I'm so happy he did that. I, he needed to show a spark because he's too good. And then Richard came back in the room and Rabbi Kaplan asked if he felt that he should apologize to the teacher. And Richard said, yes. He says, well, I'd appreciate it if you went and did that right now. And Richard went and apologized to the teacher and that was it. But he, he, was, he mm -hmm. was, he really, he really did. Yes, he was. Really I mean, all the principals did. that followed were great. I'm not saying no, but uh, there was only one Alex Kaplan. No, he, Rabbi right. Kaplan was, had been a classmate of mine at uh, YU. Mm -hmm. And so I knew him for a long time. And then he wound up as the principal there at Solomon Chester. Uh, he was a very knowledgeable guy, but he was also a great basketball player. <laughs> he played for City College in the days when City College had basketball teams. <laughs> and, um, <clears throat> you know, he was an all-around type person. That was a big thing, that we were getting somebody a who principal. was a rabbi, you know, who had all this background, and yet he had been this great superstar <laughs> basketball player. So the principal, Alex Kaplan, was very open to, you know, having the parents come in and give forth their, uh, their views. As I said, the <laughs> people, the, the board, I shouldn't talk this way, they weren't. <laughs> in other words, we knew we, we knew we had to figure things out for ourselves. His background, his approach, his approach, his was, approach was sort of uh, perfect, for perfect for us. to the members of conservative synagogues that were not that were looking for a substitute for the afternoon schools if you think about it children of conservative schools were mainly of conservative congregations were mainly going if they were taking having a Jewish education to a three-day week afternoon program which was for many people unsatisfying we found that their children 
sometimes resented the fact that after a full day in public school, their friends would be going out to play ball or whatever, and they had to go and take something in a foreign language and having no real identification necessarily with uh, Israel. So the idea of a school such as the Solomon Chapter School, which would integrate both general studies as well as Judaic studies, legacy of our people was something that the conservative movement felt in Queens was a very necessary thing. And the prime movers were rabbis from the congregation. For example, Rabbi Boxer, Rabbi Darby were the two main pillars. Others in the very first graduating class were also. Rabbi Fenster's daughter was in that class and so on. So that the beginning was with that as a one important fact. Many other uh, thoughts were there, but that was a, a very important matter to them, to have our own sort of uh, full program and feeling normal that they weren't different from their fr uh, friends. That was the beginning, the vision to create such a school that would be a happy place, a place where they could learn both and be uh, uh, the Jewish traditions, according to our understanding of them, as well as the general studies program. Our amount of time that we had available for Judaic studies and so on could vary from what they, they wanted. So that was difficult. Also, to get to know the people that I could count on, you know, you, in any kind of job. This is the person you can count on, this is one, you know, we can say yes, but... So these were the obvious things that as a new principal I would have. Plus also trying to build the confidence of parents, because remember, the people who came here to our school were people who were willing to, in a sense, be halutzim in a school they knew nothing about, decisions that were also small were to what extent was I to be in, or large, to what extent should I be concerned more with trying to help teachers, supervise, observe teachers, and help them, or to concentrate more on the other aspects of my position, both as a teacher, because I was also teaching, and also relating to parents and public relations. That was one of the things to decide how to divide my time properly. And that varied, of course, as the years went by. What part? devoted to supervision, who I could count on to assist me in that, and so on. To show that this was a school where youngsters could turn to myself, to my assistants, to the teachers at any time with loving care, that it was a school where teachers really cared, in addition to teaching the material, but this was a warm place, this was like a family. That was the thing that we wanted to accomplish to begin with, to make them feel that they were in an environment, not just a cold, unconcerned. And that to me was the beginning that was most important to start with as a school. they got there was excellent but what I love most of it is that it was joyful. I have to say the girls it, it was really egalitarian and the girls were given equal uh, participation. My uh, Rachel as a matter of fact in my speech that I gave at her bat mitzvah uh, I, I recalled her having 
said, I have to be in school early, I'm cantor today, or I'm rabbi today. So the girls were given really equal opportunity to conduct services and to, uh, and to read and to do everything. And it was, because it was, she does now to this day. She sometimes reads Torah in her shul. Uh, or she'll do a half Torah, and when she tells me she's doing it, I, I just you fell, as he you, says. I'm you, just thrilled. You feel so because good. Because she's passing that on to her daughter. If you want a Jewish future, it's the best thing for the Jewish future. What is the best thing? Day school. No question about it. Mm -hmm. The contrast of the family sitting together, of the girls learning and davening, and you know, just really having a Jewish experience, not just an onlooker. But they were the ones who were davening. That's why they can stand up and, and read the Haftorah and, and run a whole service. That's what set the pace for us, was what, Sh what Schechter taught them. I don't know what the school is like today, mm -hmm. but as the school was when they went, I would send them today, mm -hmm. definitely, because they got Zionism, they got religion, they got Hebrew, they got a feeling of commonality. It was a great school. They also got creativity and openness and a good education. And I was talking to my son Gil about it and he was very excited. He said the most important thing he felt about the school beyond the learning was uh, the sense of community he felt all the time that the people were very involved, the parents were always involved trying to improve things, and this to him was very important. I thought the Salman Shech the school fitted like a, fit, like a glove. It was a perfect fit for you. Yeah, family. perfect fit. And when I think back, I mean, Shechta was a foundation for the entire family. It not, you know, my calendar, I, I still remember, I had this huge calendar, mm -hmm. and it was all Blocked, you know, bizarre rummage sale, art auction, uh, this, that. Mm -hmm. It was just constant. And I remember the first graduation, and we were all there like grandparents, you know, everybody shut mm -hmm. just to watch the first class graduate. When we decide to take a visit off this earth, we, we will feel very comfortable knowing that we've left behind an inheritance yeah. of continuation. Uh, how, how this will be in 2030, 2040, 2050, <laughs> Who knows? Who knows? 21, 22, 50, I don't know. But, but uh, we will feel comfortable knowing that this is what we gave them. Use philanthropy to strengthen the Jewish community. His birthright has made a big difference. What we need is somebody now to do the same kind of thing for Solomon Shuster schools, you know, to endorse it. Uh, it would change and transform the Jewish community of the future. I really believe that. I always think of Schechter. It's so interesting that any time something comes up about what happened with a child or what a family's like, you think if it weren't for Schechter, would have been would it have been quite as Tom had so much Tom? Tom. I hope that it continues in the same tradition. If you want to get something out of it, you have to put something into it. And putting in means putting yourself into the situation and getting involved with the school. But it doesn't have to do with the school as such, just getting involved with Judaism and with the, the holidays and the participa participation, that will automatically bring people together. I think the Jewish education is very broad uh, in its scope. It covers topics like from Talmud all the way up to learning Hebrew, from singing songs and drama, to doing everything in, 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 in Hebrew. I think that's good. I think it's a good institution because it, it, uh, I see the um, young children, I get the I quell when I see the young kids running out and all these nice Jewish kids running out and they seem to be enthusiastic about everything. They're not dragging themselves or looking unhappy about stuff. There is a, it's a good, a, a, um, a good environment in general, mm -hmm. and a, a very good venue, I think, for, for teaching kids what's important. But the end result is really what counts, and there is no hesitation in, in our minds that if a parent has an opportunity, mm -hmm. is fortunate enough to have an opportunity to send their child to Solomon Schechter, all right? And don't get caught up in the little 
Nuance. Whatever the, whatever happens along the way, yes. uh, that's meaningless. It is the big picture. It is seeing what Schechter will produce at the end. Yeah. Yeah.